These are Dan Clark Audio's new $2,000 closed back E3 headphones, and this time they have Gorilla Glass on the back. So let's check them out. Them that's God shall get, and them that's not shall lose. So the Bible says, but it still is news. Your mama. Now we've already seen a pair of high-end closed back headphones in the form of Dan Clark Audio Stealth, which I talked about a while ago, and also of course, well, open-backed in this case, the Expanse. But what's the difference between the new $2,000 E3s and something like the Stealth? Well, actually there's a lot that's similar. So today, in today's video, I'm gonna talk about the design of the E3. And even if you are familiar with Dan Clark Audio headphones and some of the cool things they can do, such as fold into this small shape, then you might be surprised as I learned a couple of new and interesting things about the design that are maybe not quite so obvious. So then of course I'm going to talk about the technology in them and some upgrades to the technology and of course the new tuning because these sound quite different from other Dan Clark Audio headphones I've heard in the past. And then as usual I'm going to give you my impressions of them through a variety of gear including my what I call my dongle soup bowl which is full of tubes as well, don't ask about that. So stick around for that and my impressions with a variety of music and other gear. Now, of course, with impressions it requires good quality music. So in that case, I've asked Native DSD to be my sponsor of my videos and I'm very happy to have them because they not only do they make high quality music themselves with minimal amounts of mastering so you get the maximum resolution possible, but they do have a very considerable collection of music that is of very high quality. And so whether you have a DAC from Chord or Shit Audio or some other brand, they have stuff including extremely high res DSD, which can actually work with very well with some DACs. So thank you Native DSD for sponsoring this video and thank you to the artists who let me play their music in my videos. So with that, let's get into the design. Now, of course, as you saw, the E3s like the other Dan Clock Audio headphones fold into this small shape. And that allows them to fit in this small case, which is the same as the ones for the Stealth and Expanse, pretty much. If you want to compare, I've got a Focal Utopia case sitting behind me. That is, well, you can see it's kind of somewhat bigger if I get the right, if you get the right way in front of the camera. You can see that there's certainly way more compact being able to fold the headphones, whereas the Utopias, of course, cannot. And that makes them very much portable. And while, of course, the open back expanse was, I suppose, more transportable, as they're not something you'd use on public transport due to them being open backed, <clears throat> these are very much more something you might take with you. And of course, you're probably wondering, well, what about the Gorilla Glass? I'll get there, let's get into the other bits first. Now, of course, to be able to allow such flexible movement, they have this very cool organic like hinge here. And this hinge, if my camera is gonna allow me to focus, has a very cool and simple, but very well thought out mechanism that allows them to fold easily. Now, an interesting factor about that, and I'll keep them folded for the moment, is that you have, for the headband, it uses nitinol wire. Now, nitinol wire is what you have in braces. That's right, your braces for your teeth, because once it is in shape, it will stay in shape no matter how badly you deform it. And if you're cringing right now, like why am I deforming the headphones so severely? It's because I can and it does not harm them. They are built with metal and they are very robust. And that's one of the advantages of this wire. Now, speaking of that, the clamping force some people felt on the Stealth and Expanse was maybe a, just a touch loose for preference. And so the clamp on the E3 is a little bit tighter than it is on the Stealth and Expanse. However, if you have a Stealth or Expanse, or even the E3, in the middle of this hinge that I just pointed out, there is a very small set screw. Now you can actually buy alternate set screws from Dan Clark Audio and put them in and it will give you more clamping force by bending this hinge slightly. So if you do have that, it's like very cheap and a couple of minutes of work to get more clamping force as necessary. But still, I wouldn't say they clamp particularly hard. They still clamp fairly softly compared to some quite a few other headphones I have, which makes them very comfortable. 
Now, if you're wondering about this kind of twangy wire, I can hear it twanging a little bit if I flick it there, interfering with the sound at all, Dan Clark has done extensive testing to make sure that, that vibrations from the drivers do not get to the headband and, and interfere with the music. So while maybe occasionally, if you, if you say bump them, you might get a little bit of sound from the headband, the music will not cause any vibration in the headband to, that will interfere with the sound quality. Now the head pad of course is elastic, so you have this instant fit. And people always worry about elastic because it can wear out. Now I've had this pair of Stealth here since the start, this was a first production pair, and the elastic is still exactly the same as when I got them. And they've been sitting on, you know, it's, it's, it's been sitting stretched to some degree on various hooks and things around my desk for the whole time pretty much. And I can say that if you do need to replace the head pad, it is very easy to do. There are just a couple of screws in there that need to be removed, and it's like a five minute job. I mean, you can get a new head pad from Dan Clark Audio. And now I know what you're thinking, oh, but Amos, what about this Gorilla Glass? Well, if you probably saw, this has got a grill pattern underneath, which the reason for that is that they don't really sound closed back in that sense. They sound kind of very open, which I'll talk about in a bit. But this Gorilla Glass just is, well, something unique. And they're probably the first pair of headphones, and, or the first pair of headphones as far as I know, that have a full Gorilla Glass backed cover on there. And if you're wondering about durability, well, it has about the same durability as a phone which uses Gorilla Glass. You can drop them and it's, nothing should go wrong. I mean, it's not impossible to scratch them, but it's kind of unlikely. And while it's probably not impossible to crack the glass on here, well, you'd have to hit them, you know, maybe say on the edge of, say, a marble countertop at perfectly the right angle. And you have to be pretty pretty careless, in other words, to break them. And Dan Clark has indeed done drop tests and whatnot on hard floors to ensure that they will not break easily. But other than that, it's kind of a cool aesthetic for your portable headphones. Now, as always, the E3s use the same kind of cable that came with the Stealth and Expanse. And this cable uses these Hirose connectors. These connectors are medical grade connectors and they click on very readily, if I get my left and my right correct. You just twiddle them around until they snap on and they're designed to be connected and disconnected you know, hundreds of thousands of times. They're used in, in medical equipment and they are extremely robust. And you can get aftermarket cables if you so desire from numerous people who can get hold of these connectors as they are very common. Now there's one other thing you've probably noticed on the back of these, which is this hole. And if you're wondering, is that a bass vent? The answer is yes. And the result with the sound is gonna be quite interesting. But first, before we get there, we have to talk about another aspect of the design, which is the AMTS system, which you'll see inside the cups. Now, if you've seen my previous videos about the AMTS system with the Stealth and the Expanse, you'll have an idea what's going on, but there are some changes. Now, to give you an idea of what the AMTS system is, we have to talk about resonators. Now, you probably are familiar with the old idea of, you know, if you, if you play a certain tone towards a glass, if the resonance of the glass matches the tone and you play it loud enough, it will shatter. And there's a similar kind of thing that's similar that a cavity that matches the wavelength of a particular frequency will absorb those frequencies. And that's why you have, for example, perforated board walls in studios, which absorb certain frequencies and, and damp the sound. The useful thing about that is that by selecting the cavity sizes that you need, you can create what's called a Helmholtz resonator, which absorbs that, those, that particular frequency. With headphones, as you have to tune them, you have two particular issues. The first, of course, is, like I said, you want to tune them to a certain frequency, which requires a lot of work indeed on the driver. And the second thing is, when you put them on your head, you're creating this cavity inside which the sound not only reflects from the driver off the side of your head or your hair and inside the ear pads, but you also the sound reflects off your eardrum actually back out into the open. Now, if you're listening to music out in the open, you know, any reflections in your ears will just bounce off into nowhere, which is fine. But however, of course, in that cavity, they will bounce off your ears and then cause all sorts of interference with the sound and that will degrade the sound to some degree. So what the AMTS system does is it uses a series of holes which have two effects. If you block off the holes on the ear side, then towards the driver, it will absorb certain frequencies which maybe are unwanted. Or if you block off the holes on the driver side, then the resonators will be facing your ear and can be used to damp certain reflective frequencies which are known to cause interference when the headphones are on your head. Now, the cool thing about this system is that 
Dan wanted to get to lower frequencies. Now the problem with getting to lower frequencies is you need longer tubes and this the AMTS attachment is already kind of fairly deep. If it was able to get to much deeper frequencies, you'd need something that was crazy thick and headphones that were coming out here. So to that effect, with a little bit of trickery, he's, if you look carefully inside the cups, you can actually see, if I can get the position correctly, there are a couple of little extra bits up here and down the bottom which stick out. And those are extra long tubes, which allows the AMTS system to get lower down from the frequencies it usually damps, down to about three kilohertz. The net result of this, well, that's where things got very interesting. So after this break, let's talk about the sound. One of the interesting things about being in this hobby is that when a manufacturer comes out with something new and it affects how sound is produced, especially from headphones, in a significant way, it becomes a challenge how to describe what I'm hearing. And there's no less true with the E3s, which if you're used to Dan Clark Audio headphones, you may get quite a surprise from as they don't really sound quite like previous Dan Clark audio headphones at all. Now, of course, there's one more technical thing which is very relevant to the sound I want to mention is that these are 27 ohms and the sensitivity is 92 decibels per milliwatt. And that's significantly better than the stealth and expanse, which these kind of needed a fair bit of power to really get going, or if they tended to sound a little bit lackluster if they weren't powered by something significant. Well, you could kind of get away with, you know, a dongle DAC or something like that it was kind of, you were hitting the full volume. Now these are more sensitive and of course have a higher impedance so they don't require quite as much power to get going. But as a lot of the changes with the sound go, you'll probably find that they don't need much to get really interesting. Now my first impression with these E3 headphones is that they were extremely lively, kind of like bright as in forward mid-range, forward upper mid-range kind of strong. Rather like the Odyssey LCD 5s were, which were also very mid-range strong. However, there was still a very tasteful amount of bass in the music I was listening to, and a lot of it was probably more geared towards like acoustic, vocals, guitar, that kind of thing in general, which is mostly what I like. Now, of course, I ran them through a I listened to a playlist which has about 2,000 random songs of stuff I'd like, which ranges from everything under the sun from classical through to modern pop music. Now I found that with modern pop music kind of bright and maybe heading towards fatiguing. And I want to make a bit of a note here in that the impressions I'm giving are with my ears. Now an interesting thing I learned in through trying to understand how these headphones worked is that while these have a tastefully greater amount of say low bass, and probably maybe a little bit more in the upper mid-range and treble in some respects and say the Stealth and Expanse. One thing pointed out to me was that our sensitivity to the upper mid-range and treble is a lot greater than it is to bass. So if you increase the bass by say 5 dB, it's gonna sound well a bit more bassier, a bit warmer, but if you increase say mid-range and treble by 5 dB, it's gonna sound absolutely shouting in your face, kind of loud, it's gonna be very fatiguing. So while probably fundamentally the frequency response of these headphones has not changed dramatically versus say the Stealth especially, due to the way the damping has changed, the way they behave with music has. So what I found that initially I kind of had the impression that they had a bit of a maybe U or V shaped sound, but that's probably a bit of a bad description as vocals and instruments were very forward. And the mid bass wasn't super strong, but there was a tasteful amount of it. And being very forward, I was kind of reminded of Grado headphones, which can be very exciting with music such as rock. And a lot of people like that kind of sound. And I think if you're looking for a pair of high-end closed back headphones, which do have something in that direction of sound tuning, but with a good amount, reasonable amount of bass, you know, the, the kind of bass roll off you get with very open back small driver headphones, then these actually will work very well. But another aspect to that is one day I put them on and I put on this particular Cowboy Junkies song, which I'll put up the name of on the screen and which I've just forgotten off the top of my head. And there was a lot of bass, like it was really boomy. And I thought I'd lost my mind. I thought, has my ears changed that much overnight that in the morning that I'm so much more sensitive to bass that these sound boomy? They weren't, didn't sound boomy yesterday. Now going back and doing a little bit of investigating, what I found out is the first thing I realized, oh, they're vented. So I did this, I put my fingers over the vents and that boominess disappeared. And they sounded in the end, more like the stealth, at least in the bass, which to me, the stealth has a little bit, not quite enough bass for my preferences. Now, an interesting thing to note about bass preferences is of course, when Harman did their research into the Harman curve, 
they found that people's base preferences range to a really huge degree. And so my base preferences are probably a little bit greater. If you're the kind of person, say, who liked the stealth, these are probably gonna be a little bit too boomy for you, unless, of course, you tape over the vents. But some people like a lot of bass, may not find there is enough bass there. And I found that an interesting thing, like I did with the Cowboy Junkies, is it's very dependent on the music. Now, a thing that I noted with a lot of headphones is that, and something that's been kind of in the back of my mind for a long time, is that I feel like every pair of headphones I have, or most of them, tend to... You've kind of hit... You, I'm, I end up, like in these sound impressions, talking about how the headphones sound versus the music. And it tends to be more about the headphones imposing their own coloration on the music. For example, for me, things like Meze Audio's Elite tend to make everything sound kind of warm and thicker with that kind of stronger mid bass. The Imperians, of course, the original Imperians sounded very much in that manner. And of course, the new Imperians are kind of very relaxed and kind of not so dynamic in terms of the intensity of how the music comes through. I mean, if you compare to like real live music, real live music is incredibly intense versus what you hear through headphones, even very good headphones. And I always felt like, okay, so I'm describing the headphones, but not kind of describing the music. And the interesting thing about the E3 is I felt for once that I was hearing more of how the music was rather than how the headphones are, if that makes any sense. So like that Cowboy Junkie song, it has a lot of low bass or low mid bass, and it was coming through that there was a lot of low mid bass. If I was listening to well-recorded acoustic music, we have stuff from Native DSD, I have some favorites from Chesky Records as well, that sounded about spot on. I could really hear the instruments, I could really hear the intensity of the vocals, I could really hear how detail was pushed really up into your face, and there was a lot of detail coming through. Now in that, one of the aspects of course of the AMTS system is that it absorbs resonances that, well, with careful tuning, absorbs resonances that come from putting them on your head and, and sound bouncing backwards and forwards inside this you know, small chamber around your ear and actually inside your ear. So one of the interesting effects of that that I noticed is that if you look at, say, measurement graphs of many headphones, you'll find that in that, that hump area where there is a significant frequency change around you know, 2 kilohertz, 3, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 kilohertz, you'll find that a lot of headphones have these peaks. Now, when a manufacturer is in tuning them, and I'm kind of very overgeneralizing here, do they tune where the peaks kind of match what would be kind of an even curve, like if you're matching IETF or, or Harman, or do they match, say, the base of the peaks towards that and let things get a little bit kind of on the bright side, or do they kind of aim for somewhere in the middle? Now, the interesting thing is what happened if you smoothed out those peaks? Now, a lot of headphone measurements after they're taken are smoothed out. And an interesting thing happened because I was actually on the phone to Jude of HeadFi when he was measuring these headphones, or at least the pair he has. And he sent me, although I, cannot, I said I wouldn't show it, he sent me a, an unsmoothed image of the first measurements he took. And they weren't very jagged looking like a lot of pair of headphones. They were actually very smooth in the curve. So when I talked to Dan about that, he said that if you smooth out that kind of frequency range, you do get a very different effect. And we're very used to those kind of jagged peaks and the kind of subtle differences in tuning, and smoothing them all out gives a different kind of sound, and that's what I was hearing through these. Now for my ears and my tastes, I do find that a little bit too forward for preference, and the result was, like I said, with acoustic music, they sounded very spot on where I could very clearly hear how instruments and vocals were. But when I started getting into pop music, say something like Jack Johnson, which I, which tends to sound good on everything, I felt like I was hearing more distortion from that music and more about how it was recorded and I was not liking it as much as usual. It was interesting because I was also talking to Dan Clark about amps and tube amps and the like, and I was testing actually the Lear Plus headphone amp and switching around tubes. And the, initially with the stock tube, and I'll talk about this in its review, I didn't like the sound with the stock tube as much as I liked it with the solid state mode. And it wasn't until I rotated tubes that I started to like the sound. And I was testing it with the E3s. It was picking up all the really subtle, like even the unpleasant distortions out of the, the particular tube that it came with, maybe because it hadn't been running, I'm not sure. I didn't run it for that many hours but it, I wasn't liking it as much and the subtle differences were very noticeable. But now with all those frequencies that are some normally kind of jagged on a very even keel, 
I was kind of hard to describe how it sounded. Now, an interesting thing that came up when I was talking with one of my patrons is that he asked, you know, what is an analytic sound? He'd seen people saying analytic this, analytic that on HeadFi. And so I was trying to think of a good description and it tends to be headphones that are kind of very mid forward or maybe kind of brighter and they don't have as strong a bass. And that's because that, that emphasizes the, the vocals and instruments more. So you kind of more analyze the music. And I thought actually these E3 headphones are very analytical in sound because not just the higher frequencies, but even the lower frequencies like the bass, it's very like, right, this is how the music is instead of this is how the headphones are. So they're very kind of analytical on the music and extremely revealing of, you know, basically how the music is that you're listening to for better or sometimes quite often for worse. Just like the E3s are very revealing of how the music is, they're also very revealing of how equipment is. And of course, I use them from a variety of gear, such as dongle decks that I have here, all the way up through various amps through to high-end gear. Now, I started, for example, with Quartz TT2 and M Scaler because it should be, at least technically, the most uncolored and neutral gear that I have and probably the best for evaluating the sound quality of components in general. But I also wanted to see how they performed out of different amplification. And with that, actually, there was a surprising number of differences. For example, going from the TT2 and M Scaler down to the Hugo 2, which I've got sitting here, of course, there's going to be maybe less overall detail. Maybe the soundstage won't be quite as deep, although still pretty good given that chord specializes in recreating the actual soundstage of music. And I found that actually the difference in soundstage and I could hear very clearly the shift in the position of instruments and the like between the Hugo 2 and the TT2 far more than I'd actually expected. Likewise, again, going down to something even lower like Wu Audio's Tube Mini, which is a very good portable more portable tube dongle amp, if you can call it that. I could hear again like the clarity between, you know, where you could hear the position of the instruments was again stepping down. And with something like these dongle decks, while they are actually surprisingly capable for portable gear, there's still a limit to how much volume you can get, how loud they can get because they simply run out of power. Now, of course, the E3s are a few decibels more sensitive than say, the Stealth and Expanse, which translates to them requiring maybe something like less than half the amount of current or probably power, I should say, into the headphones, although with the slightly higher impedance, maybe a touch more voltage, but still under the kind of amount that is going to push the limits of anything, including a dongle deck. But these things, because they have a power limit since they have to be used in a portable situation, will eventually just simply run out of volume. And I could run them, including the Tube Mini at 100 with some lesser, maybe less compressed music, such as acoustic music, very easily. Something like this, even with the E3s, and especially, of course, with the Stealth and Expanse, if you try and push it with very uh, compressed music, very you know high volume music, which has a lot going on, then the dynamics will start to compress at higher volume. So there is a limit to how much you can do with one of these. But if you're like me and you don't actually listen that loud, they, the E3s were surprisingly capable out of now the better portable gear. And that should translate, of course, very well into good portable players, especially the ones above $1,000. Now, of course, when you move on to higher end gear, it was very clear what was going on between components. Likewise, something that these smaller amps, of course, will power the E3 quite adequately. And of course, a similar situation to portable gear when you try and listen really loud at high volumes, especially with music with a lot of deep bass, or if you go for the, the full level of uh, Intensity with things like movie soundtracks that have very sometimes have very very low bass down to like 20 30 Hertz which can get very loud very quickly Then you'll start to get compression and that kind of thing because then these things will start to run out of steam to some degree And you'll definitely notice that with a pair of headphones like these I think it was very interesting in the other end of the range up in the treble area because of that slightly greater intensity it was very easy to make out, say, the difference in distortion between different tubes out of the new Lear Plus. And I put a lot of that down to the much increased clarity from the implementation of the AMTS system. One that's probably going to annoy some people is 
that of course the cable itself now effect audio sent me a cable of theirs it's their only headphone cable and i requested one with a dan clark audio termination now i haven't said anything about this cable or written anything about it but then i remembered i had it when i had the e3s and i thought it would be interesting to compare how it sounds versus the stock cable it's an interesting one it's an all copper cable and it has a removable plug system which is very handy it comes with a little box which i've got floating around on my desk here where you have different terminations, 4.4 millimeter, 3.5 and 2.5, although 2.5 I suppose is on the way out. And it makes it very easy to switch between systems with it, especially handy if I want to evaluate portable gear because then I can switch in portable plugs very easily. Now I wasn't expecting any particular difference with this cable, but when I did put it on, and, and of course I can't switch very quickly between cables, only as fast as I can play music and then switch the uh, plugs, I did feel that this cable brought out a bit more it expanded the kind of warmth of the bass a bit better and it seemed to separate out kind of the bass mids and treble a bit more clearly than the stock DCA cable. And of course it's a subtle thing, some people will not notice so much of a difference, but I found it actually benefited a bit and of course the very kind of, and I'm going to call it analytical nature of these E3 headphones, does make it easy to discern even subtle things such as cables. And if you're so inclined to not care about cables and you just don't want to even think about it, the stock cable is absolutely adequate and I've been using the stock cable or cables as I have a the collection of 4.4mm, 6.3 and 4-pin XLR that are available with the Dan Clark Audio headphones, and I've been using the stock cable fine and enjoying all those headphones with that. So in turn, people often ask, you know, what's the minimum kind of headphone amplifier to get the best out of them? If you're not listening too loud, you can get away with the small amps, but probably the minimum, and this tends to be fairly general with headphones, is something around this kind of size, whether it be from, say, Shit Audio or one of the Chinese manufacturers, they will generally power the headphones quite adequately, although you probably won't get quite as much detail as higher end gear. They're of course fantastic out of the Mjolnir, and I was using them, like I said, to evaluate the Lear Plus and other headphone amplifiers because they revealed all these subtle details and the differences between different components and setups very readily. Of course, though, if you do have high-end gear, like I have a very high-end tube amp and, of course, the cord gear, you will be very rewarded with the sound quality that comes out of these headphones. Similarly, if you want a pair of headphones that gives you a high-end portable experience that isn't a pair of in-ear monitors, even something like this Enlium amp with its current mode output works extremely well with the E3 since they have a flat impedance. The idea of the current mode, of course, is to produce lower distortion than a regular voltage mode output. And that, in the very the great resolution I can get out of the HPA 23RM, works extremely well with the E3 headphones. A bit of a last minute thing, if you haven't already noticed that a few hours have gone by since my last take, Jude at Headfire has kindly provided the measurements of the E3 headphones, and in that we see some interesting characteristics. One of the things he did early, and I'm not going to show this particular one, is an initial measurement showed that even unsmoothed, there was a considerable lack of bumpiness, or actually or zero bumpiness essentially, in the frequency response measurement. Likewise, looking at the distortion measurement, you'll see a considerable drop above 2 kilohertz, and that's very likely the effect of the AMTS system reducing distortion. Some, in some points, it's below 0.01%, which is outstanding for a pair of headphones. And even in the rest of the range for, from 20 hertz through to 2 kilohertz, the distortion is below 0.1%, which, mean, which goes a long way to explain why I was hearing what I heard. An interesting thing Headfires provided is two measurements, one unnormalized and one where the, the frequency response measurements have been matched up as closely as they can be. One thing I noticed significantly is that there is a much greater presence at 4 kilohertz, which makes a lot of sense in my feeling that it brought instruments and vocals very forward. And there's also a little bit more going from 6 to 8 kilohertz there compared to the stealth which is why I often felt they were actually brighter. Now, although that the stealth in comparison, it doesn't seem to have much difference in frequency response between 20 hertz and uh, say the uh, one kilohertz, it does seem that the different damping system in the E3s does affect the perception of bass versus the stealth. Likewise, compared to the expanse, we have that greater presence in the four kilohertz area range, or about three and a half to five kilohertz, and then a little bit more through six to eight kilohertz, or even six to 10 kilohertz as well, if you normalize the graphs, and a touch more mid-bass, of course, which we saw in the expanse to begin with, between 100 
and 200 hertz. And this jives a lot with my impressions of the differences between the headphones. So the, while they do seem to have that more reserved base of the stealth, they do have a very much more energetic kind of mid and upper mid range, which does bring that intensity through. And combined with the very low distortion from the AMTS system and the uh, different damping system does give more of a sense of what I felt initially, which was a kind of a U or a V-shaped sound. Especially since they have that typical closed black planar frequency response where there is somewhat of a dip in the mid bass. So overall, I think that Dan Clark has come out with a very outstanding pair of headphones. It's very easy to pick them up, plug them into something and get a very intense listen. However, will that listen be too intense for some? That may be the case, especially as like in the past, that especially that four kilohertz presence can be too forward and too intense for many people. And usually it is for me. But after I ran them for a few days to ensure that any kind of run in on the drivers had been complete, I found that with a lot of music, such as one particular track I came across, a live recording of Daniel Ponder at KCRW Radio singing the track Frey. And it's from on her album, Some of Us Are Brave. And that was is such an intense performance of that track. She's a really wonderful singer. And that was really wonderful through these headphones. Likewise, acoustic music in general didn't have that, it, what it may be in some cases a kind of sometimes feels like an excessive intensity. Acoustic music, whether it be classical, jazz, anything that's well recorded and not compressed, just sounds fantastic through these with a really great sense of depth and space. So I think acoustic music lovers who want a pair of excellent headphones, especially one they can readily take with them, will find these very enjoyable. With pop and rock, it tended to reveal even music that sounds really good out of everything like Jack Johnson, it tended to feel like yeah, I was revealing the imperfections in the recording really well. Although I think that you're the kind of person who really likes to rock out in music like your ACDC and other rock music, you'll find these an intense experience, which is a lot of fun. Down the track, I hope that anyone who does get a pair who has seen this video does post their impressions, especially with particular gear and music and how they feel about them in the comments later on, as that will help people down the track who are interested in buying these headphones. As always, thank you to all my supporters and Native DSD for sponsoring this video and the artists who provided music for me to use. So as always, thanks once again for watching and I look forward to chatting to you online. Your mama may your papa may help, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own.